We have been studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had just reached verse 11 of chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 11. The Holy Spirit has dealt seriously in this epistle with the doctrine of grace and law. There had been those who were willing to confess that one needed to believe in Jesus Christ, but there had to be additional work done. In this particular case, it, that was circumcision. The overall theme is adding anything to the finished work of Jesus Christ. In the fifth chapter, we've been exhorted by the Holy Spirit to stand firmly. In fact, we've been commanded to stand firmly in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. It isn't that He's making us free. He has, hath made us free contrary to much of the preaching of the last couple of generations. That which underlies our walk with the Lord is not our faith or our trust, but His grace. And it's the departure from that grace that's been the great mark of the last couple of generations. Christ has made you free. We are free. It goes on to say, do not become entangled or, or set aside or directed away with the yoke of bondage. There's no reason for that. You're free. Now, many have suggested, well, if you're free, how could you be entangled with the yoke of bondage and that's the old man. The new man cannot be entangled with a yoke of bondage. We got down to verse 10, and we rejoiced in the fact that the Holy Spirit has Paul write, I have confidence in you. And I stress that God is confident in us I'm sure Paul was confident in the Galatians, but it is God the Holy Spirit that's confident in us. We may not be confident in Him, but I stress again that our walk with the Lord is not based on our confidence, but in the fact that He, God, has confidence in us, and that has to be the new man. Looking at verse 11 then, and I, brethren, the Holy Spirit has Paul write this. You know, one has to wonder if he really wanted to write it. If I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. We need to look at a couple of things in that verse. First of all, Paul did preach circumcision. That's what he did. He went around willing to burn Christians at the stake if he had to, to throw them into prison because he was zealous for the law. That's what he did. And anybody in Galatia could say, hey, you know this man, he professes to have changed, but let me tell you what he did. And you could go back years in his life. He did preach circumcision. He did preach law. Yet it was on the road to Damascus that God revealed to him that one's life for God is not, not vested in law, in the law, but in the grace of God. We have one who was zealous for the law who now became zealous for grace. Astounding. 
It is astounding, folks, how much we talk about grace today. We have all kinds of grace churches. But to grace, we always tend to want to add something. Your belief, your trust, your surrender, your victory, your whatever. But that is not what God has revealed to us. That which undergirds you in your walk and your life is the grace of God. The grace of God. I'm fairly certain that most of you have heard literally hundreds, if not thousands, of sermons on surrendering to God and living a victorious life. And I'm going to tell you that none of that, in my opinion, is biblical. You do have the victory. He always causes us to triumph. If those things aren't true, then God's a liar. Your walk is not based on your surrender, your acceptance, or your trust. But it's based upon the grace of God vested in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He did preach circumcision, but what a dramatic change in Paul's life. You know, a man who was apparently a multimillionaire, a man of of great influence, a man who is highly respected in his own nation, suddenly becomes a man who's stoned, who's beaten with lashes, who's thrown in prison, who's rejected by his friends, rejected by his peers. Why? Why? Because he stood for the grace of God. If I still am zealous for the law, if I still preach law, why do I then suffer persecution? And he did. The Holy Spirit has been very careful to reveal all that happened in the life of Paul. In the last oh, several generations, we've had preaching that leads people to believe that if there's a problem in their life, well, it's the way they're living. And everything ought to be peace and wonder and joy and, and riches and, and who knows what. And it, if it isn't that way, well, there's sin in your life. And you look at Paul. Look at Paul. Where did anything go easy? They tried to kill him. They beat him. They stoned him. They threw him in prison. And he was eventually beheaded. And his life was for Christ. Behold, I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Modern Christianity wants the victory wants the victory due to you. The Bible says the victory is Christ. Why do I yet suffer persecution? The inference there is that if you preach law, you don't suffer persecution. And that's true. Who can argue? It's, it's, it's sort of like arguing against motherhood. I mean, isn't it a good thing not to lie? Yeah, that's good. Isn't it a good thing not to murder? Bury, you know, especially if you plan to murder me. It's a good thing that the, there isn't anything intrinsically wrong with the law. How can you get in trouble for saying people shouldn't lie? You know, politicians, uh, you know, they may have a real problem with that, but there isn't persecution in teaching human works. And that's what we do. If you haven't succeeded in your life, well, you haven't tried the right way or you haven't tried hard enough, it's your fault. But if you preach grace, you have the offense of the cross. 
It isn't what you do. It isn't what you believe. It isn't, it isn't what you receive. It isn't what you surrender. It's, it is none of those things that are preached worldwide. What it is, big surprise, is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in your place. He didn't die on the cross because He's a martyr. He didn't die on the cross because He's a good guy. He didn't die on the cross because you're a depraved sinner and there's no other solution for that sin. When we speak, folks, dearly beloved, when we speak of the blood of Christ or the cross of Christ, we're not speaking about a wooden stake or red blood that flows out of the veins. We're talking about God Almighty becoming incarnate in human flesh and dying in our place because there was no other way. It, it could not be done by your surrender, by your acceptance, by your belief, by your turning over a new leaf, or by your doing anything that might win you merit with God. The cross says, the cross says, you cannot gain merit, you cannot win merit with God, that you are redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. No other reason. You are not redeemed because you believe. You are not redeemed because you accept. You are not redeemed because you receive. You are not redeemed because you did anything. You are redeemed because you are one of God's children and Jesus Christ paid the price Totally and completely. He didn't pay it up until the moment that, well, you, you believed. He didn't pay it for some of the sin in your life. Folks, He paid it completely. And as I pointed out, I don't know how many times, you stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That's how God looks at you in Christ. Is the blood of the cross sufficient? The theological system, the church system, says no, no, it's not. There has to be more. And it, all the literature is just replete with the things that you have to do to live a victorious Christian life. Dearly beloved, your life is victorious because of Jesus Christ, not you. He always causes you to triumph. Always. Much of modern preaching says that, well, you could triumph if you, you did whatever. And, and it's your fault if you don't. My Bible says that you are complete in Him and that He always causes us to triumph in Christ. That's just impossible, says the human mind. It, it, cannot, it can't be. And that's why the one who stands staunchly for the grace of God in Jesus Christ suffers persecution. And it, it has been that down through the years. It's nothing new. Why do I yet suffer persecution? Because if I preach law, the offense of the cross is ceased. The cross says that he who looks horrible and lives a horrible life is going to go to heaven. And you know, people just can't get that. They don't understand that. And he who is wonderfully kind and sweet and giving and doesn't break any laws, you know, he's a good guy, so he's going to go to heaven. The legal system says people who go to hell are people who live horrible lives. And I'm telling you, that is not the truth. The legal system says the people who go to heaven are the people who live good lives. You know, anybody will buy that, folks. Anybody. All the religions of the world will buy that. That, that is a basic tenet of all false religions. That one's merit is the basis of his destiny. 
I was raised in a church. Every Sunday evening, I, I said to my father, you know, one time when I was quite young, I, I don't want to go to church tonight. And his answer, uh, I'll never forget it. What excuse could you possibly give for not wanting to go to church? And, and I never raised the question again. But every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening, in letters about one foot high, decision determines destiny written across the front of the church. Dearly beloved, that is every religion in the world except Christianity. Here I am in a so-called Christian church and the phrase that they have at the front of the church is true of every religion in the world except the one that professed to be the religion of that church. I'm here to tell you, folks, that your decision does not determine your destiny. Your life is hid with Christ in God, and you can rest with absolute absolute assurance and confidence in the finished work of Christ. But that confidence brings persecution. Law results in no offense of the cross. But to recognize the cross means that God Almighty had to descend from glory, become our kinsman redeemer, and be made sin, though He knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What an amazing truth. What an amazing truth. It's my heart's desire that many Christians know this before they get caught up to meet the Lord. Many have suggested the 12th verse is not inspired, that Paul is writing under the leading of the Holy Spirit, but when he reaches the 12th verse, in his anger and in his disgust, he, he utters a few words. I would, I would they were even castrated who trouble you. Circumcision's not enough. Just go, just go the whole way and emasculate yourself. Mutilate yourself. Folks, you know, if you follow this channel, you know I am persuaded that this is God's Word and that every word is God-breathed. If you want any idea of how disgusting human works is to the Almighty and eternal God, it seems to me that it's the 12th verse of Galatians chapter 5. Or a couple of verses in Malachi. You know, I will spread dung on your religious observances. I wish they were emasculated. Who troubled you? Who troubled you? Who troubled you? It isn't that the law isn't good. It's that the inference is that God's fulfillment of the law wasn't good. That's the problem with teaching law. Absolutely nothing... Please don't mis, misconstrue what I'm saying. Absolutely nothing wrong with the law. By the law, we, we know sin. The terrible thing of adding law to... The finished work of Christ is to suggest that God's solution for the law was not good enough. No doubt, that's the heart of Paul that we're reading, but I believe it's the revelation of the Holy Spirit that it is absolutely disgusting to God that anyone would even dare suggest that to add human merit to the finished work of Jesus Christ. For brethren, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. It's, it's an heiress passive. You should not say in that verse that you've been called unto liberty if you want to be. Doesn't say that. It says you have been. 
says you have been called unto liberty. That's an established fact. It's a, it is a statement of fact. You have been called unto liberty. You're free. We saw that in verse 1. Wherein Christ hath set us free, hath, hath made us free. That again is an aorist. It's done. It isn't something being done, dearly beloved. It isn't something being done. It isn't something that will be done. It's done. You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We're going to go on in, in uh, just a little bit and find that the Holy Spirit differentiates between the flesh and the spirit. There are some who are unwilling to admit or, or do not believe the Scriptures teach that you have two natures. When the Word says that you have an old man and a new man, an old man that can do nothing but sin, a new man that cannot sin. What I have differentiated in the rest of this chapter, and we'll spend time on it as the weeks go by, Lord willing, is flesh and spirit. The works of both are enumerated. Well, the works of the flesh are enumerated. And the fruit of the spirit is enumerated. And we'll look at the fact that they are different terms. One is works. One is fruit. What the Spirit bears is fruit. What the flesh does is it works at it. And, and what it works at is a whole list of things, none of which sound very good. And yet the, the thesis of those who had come to Galatia and the thesis of this epistle in its treatment against law is that the flesh can do good things. It can do good things. For the law is, uh, is, is a carnal commandment. They appear to be good on the surface. You don't have to take a new creation who is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable and tell it not to lie. There has to be something wrong with the new creation if it, if it even could lie, which it can't. I am persuaded God teaches that whosoever is born of God, that which is born of God, does not sin, has no power to sin. That which sins is our old man. And we can't say that we don't sin because our old man is as much with us as our new man is. But the law isn't for the new man. Folks, in Timothy, I'm sure you've read the verse, we are told that the law was not made for a righteous man. Were you made righteous in Christ? Well, if you are not made righteous in Christ, then the, you're not His. Or there's something in this book that's not true. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And by the disobedience of the one, the many were made sinners. And in the same way, in the same way, by the obedience of the one, Christ shall the many be made righteous. Well, how were you made righteous? By something you did? No, by the obedience of Christ. Modern Christianity says that, well, you're made righteous by something you did or, or something that you do. It started with God, maybe, okay? But you had to initiate a process in a relationship with Him, you had to begin that. doesn't matter that the Word says He's the author and finisher of our faith. Forget that. 
Folks, you were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. Not by your obedience, not by your surrender, not by your believing, not by your receiving, not by your repenting. You were made righteous by, the Word says, you were made righteous by the obedience of Jesus Christ and that doesn't need law. Doesn't need law. That's why in Hebrews they're called carnal commandments because they were they were commandments to the old man, not to the new creation in Christ. So if we're going to use our liberty for an occasion to the flesh, it will be the old man. Now, virtually everybody that reads that immediately thinks of an occasion to the flesh well, as that's well, Steve, yeah, I know what that is. That's going into a bar. Or in my mother's case, it was plain flinch. You know, and that bothered me because I liked flinch. Same with bowling, as I pointed out, I think, in a previous video, you know. I, I, I heard church folk tell me when I was a kid, you know, you can't be a Christian and bowl. And, well, and I just learned to bowl. And that affected my score. Uh, my score was kind of getting up there, you know, until they told me that. I was asked to, to teach a Bible class in Ardmore, Oklahoma. They, they had three pages in a document I was, to, I was to sign of things that I wouldn't do, one of which was to wear lipstick. I, well, I didn't, I didn't have any problem with that one. Dearly beloved, how can the Christian community do that? And almost always, this occasion to the flesh is something that takes your old man for a ride in the lusts of the flesh. How do you know in the context an occasion to the flesh isn't some legal commandment added to the finished work? Of Jesus Christ because that folks that is what the Judaizers were doing that's what they were trying to get the Galatians to do is to add something to the finished work of Jesus Christ which was fleshly I'm not gonna I'm not going to tell you that an occasion to the flesh here cannot be that, you know, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm free in Christ. I'll go ahead and I'll do this, that, or the other thing. I'll go, I'll just do what I want. That's, you know, that's difficult for me to understand in that verse. It is not difficult for me to believe that you people sin. That's, that's not hard for me to believe. It's not hard for me to believe that I sin. But it is virtually impossible for me to believe that you want to do that. That that's your utmost desire. That's why I find this hard to believe that the occasion of the flesh is, you know, wow, I'm just going to go out and I'm just going to live like the devil tonight, you know, because I'm, 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 I'm free in Christ. And so, I'll... listen, <laughs> dearly beloved, <clears throat> Now, Lord, I, I was teaching a Bible class in a little suburb of Albuquerque in the 90s, back in the 90s, and some girl said, you know, oh, well, are you saying I couldn't go out and sleep with any man I want to tonight? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm saying you can't. And, and she said, well, yes, I could. I said, well, go ahead and do it. And she said, well, I don't want to. Folks, I've had people over the years tell me over and over and over again, do you think a Christian could do this or that or the other thing and go to heaven? And I, I was asked to leave a Sunday school class once, you know, after, after somebody in the class raised his hand. Uh, well, uh, you think a Christian could murder and go to heaven? I said, well, you mean like David? Uh, the minister was furious with me. I thought he not only committed adultery, 
but he committed premeditated murder. And I fully expect to meet David in heaven. A Christian can do anything and go to heaven. It isn't your sin that surprises God. It isn't your, your sin that surprises me. What would surprise me is you want to go out and rob a bank knowing, knowing that you committed a sin. I'm, I'm not saying you wouldn't rob a bank. I'm, but I'm saying what I am saying is deep in your heart, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. But the one exception, okay, is the Christian can want to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I believe that in this context, in this context, is the main thrust of the occasion to the flesh. Here is someone, here is someone who would be absolutely repulsed by some lustful sin, who's thrilled to add baptism as a necessary requirement to go to heaven. you got to be kidding. I say the one pales into insignificance compared to the other. Almost any sin that you could name, you know, that you call sin, I would think is virtually nothing compared to adding any fleshly commandment to the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is what caused the Holy Spirit to inspire Paul to write, I wish that they would castrate themselves. Castrate themselves. Who trouble you. Virtually no church is, is going around exhorting you to commit adultery or to rob banks or to, or to murder your enemies. And, you know, and we'd think that was horrible. But apparently, folks, we don't think it's horrible to preach that you have to do something to ensure your redemption. We don't think that's bad at all. You have to somehow add to the finished work of Christ, live a victorious life, live a surrendered life, who knows what. Thousands of people will shamefully walk down to a, a, an unashamedly, I should say, walk down to an altar this, this week someplace, rededicating their lives because their trust is in how they live, not in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Oh, dearly beloved. Churches today are exhorting people to diminish the finished work of Christ, to make it less than it is. That's what's horrible. That is using our liberty as an occasion to the flesh. To suggest that the flesh can add merit to our standing with God, some somehow improve our standing with God. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, that's horrible. That's terrible. That's awful. Look at the next verse. If you bite and devour one another, Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Why is that put there? Because the problem with adding human works to the finished work of Christ is that it opens every one of us up to terrible examination and criticism. Criticism. When we begin to add requirements, people are going to look around, well, you, did, you didn't do this and you, you shouldn't have done that and, and you, know, you missed going to prayer meeting. Uh, you, know, uh, you went bowling instead. Uh, come on. You know, if you really love the Lord, Steve, you wouldn't do that. 
I mean, that's terrible. And that's what happens. It was always in the church I was raised in. Well, Jay's in the beer joint again. We got to pray and get the poor kids saved, uh, you know, again. You know, everybody was looking at what everybody did. And nobody, I'm sorry, I want to shout this. Everybody was looking at what everybody did and nobody was looking at what Christ had done. Nobody is looking at what Christ has done. An occasion to the flesh will take your vision off things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It will take all of the rejoicing out of your life. It will strip you bare of any, any peace, joy, praise that you be not consumed one of another. The very people who are preaching victory based on works of the flesh are robbing folks of the very victory that's already theirs in Christ. Folks, these are those for whom Christ died. Imagine causing these brothers and sisters harm, such harm. If we add anything to the finished work of Christ, we lay ourselves open for criticism and examination and people begin to bite and devour. Look, look how He lives. Look what He does. When our vision ought to be centered on our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a marvelous, marvelous privilege to walk with peace and rest and joy in that which was accomplished for us by Christ and in Christ alone. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, so very thankful for Your Word. What a marvelous privilege to rest in the finished work of Christ. May these truths grip our hearts and change our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now unto Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you without fault before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, honor, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Till next time. Thanks for watching.